This is the new Toyota RAV4. And Toyota has renamed what RAV stands for. You see, RAV used to stand for Recreational Activity Vehicle. Makes sense, doesn't it? Four is obviously four wheel drive. But now they say that it stands for Robust Accurate Vehicle. Because that's more in keeping with the fact that this car is tougher. Actually, it is tougher. The body is 57% stiffer than the old RAV4. So, yeah, don't worry, it's robust. Remember, they said so. It's fine. Now, this is the kind of car you're going to be looking at if you're considering something like a Volkswagen Tiguan or a Honda CRV. This, though, is not available as a diesel at all. It's petrol only. In terms of starting price, the RAV4 range kicks off at just under £30,000, but you can save an average of around 1700 quid off one through CarWow. Now, if you're thinking about buying a new car, click on the pop-out banner just up there, the top right-hand corner of the screen, or follow the link below the video to see how much you can save on a new car through CarWow to make sure you're paying the right price. This new RAV4 looks way more interesting than the old one. I don't even mind the huge wheel arches. As standard, you get 17-inch alloys. These are the upgraded 18, and they've got a chrome effect on them, but all models get privacy glass at the rear, you get roof bars, and yet at the front as well. It's got a very distinctive face. I like it. Looks a bit like a stormtrooper in this colour. What's it like on the inside there? Well, let's have a look. It's pretty smart in here as well. I do like the design, it's interesting, and there's nice soft touch materials here on the dash with the stitching effect there, here on the door tops as well. There are some areas where it's not quite so great though. For instance, you've got scratchy plastics down here, here, up here, and just here on the handles. But then there's some other bits that do make up for that. Rubbery effect here on the inside of the door handle. There's rubbery effect here and even up here on the stereo controls. The layout of everything is fairly logical, but there are a few Toyotaisms in the way that the controls for the high beam light and the heated steering wheel and the rear windscreen wiper are here rather than with their associated controls. And I have noticed this, look, you do get a bit of wobble on the center console if you shake it, but it still feels pretty robust and being a Toyota, it shouldn't break. What I'm not so keen on is this though, look, the lights are old fashioned filament bulbs. Now though, let's talk about the RAV4's equipment levels. The range kicks off with the Icon and that gets a eight inch touchscreen and a seven inch digital driver's display. There's also automatic cruise control, which will slow the car to keep you a safe distance from the car in front. It will even work in stop start traffic and the steering will automatically steer to keep you in lane. And of course, there's also auto emergency braking if you don't spot that a car in front of you has stopped. The Icon also has dual zone climate control and automatic lights and wipers. Finally, you also get a reversing camera and at the press of a button, you can go to a wider view and also you can change the look at the guidelines shown on the screen to help you park. The next trim level up is called design and that adds front parking sensors. You also get keyless entry and an electrically operated tailgate. You also get satellite navigation added to the car's infotainment system, which is kind of a must because the RAV4 does not come for now with Apple CarPlay nor Android Auto, though they may be added later and you might actually be able to retrofit them if you've already bought a RAV4. Now the design model for me is the sweet spot in the range because you've got the right amount of kit and it's a decent price. However, if you want a leather interior, you need to pay extra for this Excel version. You also get electric operation of the driver's seat, heated seats and a heated steering wheel as well. It also gets blind spot monitoring and all LED headlights for a better view at night. Finally, there's the dynamic model and that adds some sporty touches such as two-tone paint, black alloy wheels, black headlining and some sport seats. Okay, let's move on to the infotainment system. I do like the way that it's positioned up here, so you don't have to take your eyes too far off the road to see what's going on. In terms of the infotainment system itself, well, the screen isn't very high resolution, but at least it's colorful. The menus are laid out clearly, and you get plenty of physical shortcut buttons, which is nice. They're easy to hit when you're driving. It's all pretty logical, but the screen isn't very responsive. The voice commands are okay, but they only work with specific phrases and it's quite limited. It is easy to import a destination into the satellite navigation system, but it takes ages for the system to calculate a route and even longer to add a waypoint. And overall, I don't think that the system in this car is quite as good as in a Kia Sorento. And if you want to see my full in-depth video review of a Kia Sorento, just click up there, the pop-up banner in the top right-hand corner of the screen, or follow the link below the video. In terms of comfort here in the front, well, there is plenty of adjustment in the steering wheel, so that's good. The driver's seat, it moves far enough back or forwards and you can jack it quite high or low. So 
whether you're big or small, you're gonna be fine. One thing I have noticed though, is that while this almost is super squidgy and soft, the one on this side is actually quite ow. That is not so good. As for practicality, well, you can fit a 1.5 litre bottle in the door bin, which is impressive. You got a couple of cup holders there and they can hold a cup of coffee and they're not too deep that you can't fit in a smaller cup without it knocking the lid off. The space there for your mobile phone and charging points, a 12 volt socket there, augs in and a USB charging port there as well. Space under the armrest with a little tray and look, room underneath for some gloves. Don't ask why I carry those around with me. There's also some more USB ports under here as well. And then there's a little space here, which I wonder what it's for, but I think I figured it out, look. It fits an emergency tea bag there, just in case you need to stop and have a, have a brew when you're on the move. And there's some of the weird kind of storage areas here. There's another one just up here where I keep my hand sanitizer. The glove box is only okay, but you get this other storage area up here, which I think is just perfect for me to keep my car wire stick of truth. There's also a little slot down here, which is perfect for holding your cards. That's where I'm keeping my press card. Look, a bit surprised to find that I am, in fact, a genuine journalist. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the back. Now, one of the things about this new RAV4 is that they've actually lowered the hip point, which makes it easier to just flop into the doors. They don't open the widest, but they're wide enough. And yeah, it's still easy to get in to this car. And once you're in, look at this, right? So loads of knee room, and you can slide your feet under the seat in front to stretch out. Headroom, even with the optional sunroof, is okay for me and people over six foot tall will be fine even with that in place. The middle seat is a bit raised, so it feels like a perch if you're in the middle, but because there's not too much of a hump in the floor, there is plenty of space for everyone's feet. In fact, it's actually quite good with three in the back because this is a very wide car. So even taller people who are sat on the outer seats won't feel like their heads are touching the roof where it curves in at the top of the windows. So that's good. What's not so good is this look. So yes, you have an armrest with some cup holders, but there is no through loading at all. That is not very good on a car which is supposed to be designed for people with active lifestyles. Down here though, you do have a couple of charging ports, which is great, and there's a little pocket there to keep your iPad. But if you're sat behind the driver, look, you don't have one. You do have some decent sized door bins. Look, they fit that in there. And I love the fact that the windows are nice and large in the back and it's great that they do go all the way down so you can lean out. Kids will really like that. Speaking of kids, when it comes to fitting a child seat, the ice fix anchor points are uncovered so they're really easy to get to. And because you've got a lot of space in the back, it's dead simple to just manoeuvre the seat and lock it into place. If you have two child seats fitted in the back, you haven't got much space in between them. You might be able to squeeze a child in there, but your mother-in-law certainly wouldn't be able to fit. What a shame, eh? Now let's move on to the boot. So. In terms of the capacity, it's about average for this size of car. For instance, it's a little bit smaller than a Volkswagen Tiguan's. In fact, you could fit 13 extra of these in the Volkswagen's boot compared to this car's. But still, look, there's going to be enough room for a family's luggage. In fact, underneath the low cover, you can fit two large suitcases with two smaller suitcases on top. There's easily enough room for a baby buggy a set of golf clubs and a load of soft bags as well. I also like the fact that you've got no load lips so you can just slide things out dead easy. You've got some extra storage under here as well. There are the obligatory tether points there and they feel quite expensive and tough. You've also got a 12 volt socket there if you need to power something like a drinks cooler. If you want to fold down the rear seat, it's a bit of a faff because you have to lean in. There are no releases in the boot here or here like you have on some other cars, but once you do have the seats down, look, you can see you get a completely flat floor, so it's very easy to slide things to the front. And with the seats folded, this car's capacity is slightly bigger than a Volkswagen Tiguan. So you can fit two large boxes across the back seat with a smaller one sitting in between. And there's space for 11 more small boxes, two large suitcases, one small suitcase, and two soft bags. And by the way, Toyota specifically designed this low bay to be long enough to be able to swallow a bike with both its wheels attached. Because after all, this is a robust, accurate vehicle. Now then, it's time for the car wow five annoying things about this car. This car constantly makes beeps and bongs at you. Whatever you do, it always seems to just make a right old racket. Oh, gets on my nerves. The electric tailgate takes ages to close. Look, I'm gonna time it. Come on, come on. Imagine if it's raining. 
Be annoying, wouldn't it? Is it there yet? Come on. That's it properly shut. 12 seconds. You might expect an edgy looking SUV to have a horn that sounds a little bit like this. But no, the actual sound of the RAV4's horn is this. You might think that this car passes the car wow sticker truth because look, real exhaust pipes. However, the XL model fails on a technicality because look, you've got these huge chrome surrounds which are fake. I mean, look, I can wedge the stick in there. The brakes make an odd sound, listen. Then you get that drilling sound. What's that all about? It's not all negative though. Here's five good things about this car. You see these bumps on the roof? Well, they're specifically designed to help the air flow across the top of the vehicle and that reduces drag when you're driving at speed, which helps improve the economy. Check this out. So look, the car's load cover is hidden underneath the false floor until you need it, which is absolutely brilliant, as is the fact that if you want, you can reverse the floor so that you've got a, oops, wipe down surface. Perfect if you've got a dirty dog that you need to carry in your car. You don't have to worry about the backs of your trousers getting dirty by rubbing against the sills if the car's been driving on a muddy road because look, they'll always be clean thanks to the fact that look, the doors extend all the way over and they're protected by cladding. Don't worry, this might, it'll come off. Four-wheel drive versions of the RAV4 has something called trail mode. Now, when you select it, it alters the changes from the gearbox and the throttle response, so it's just a little bit better for driving on slippery surfaces. Also, if the car detects one of its wheels is losing traction and starting to spin, say it's off the ground, it will automatically break that wheel to send the power to the wheels that do have grip to get you going again. Being a Toyota, the RAV4 gets a five-year warranty. Mwah! That was weird. The engine lineup for the RAV4 is pretty simple because there's just one hybrid. And that's it. So that uses a 2.5 litre petrol engine and it's mated to an electric motor. And then you have 215 horsepower, which is good for 0 to 60 in around eight seconds, which is all right. You can get the RAV4 with front wheel drive or all wheel drive, though all wheel drive is not available on the entry level car. I'm not sure you need it either because it does cost an extra £4,000. Now it is important for you to make sure that you're paying a fair price for a car. So what you should do is go onto the car wire configurator, put the details in. So I'll do it for this car, the RAV4 front wheel drive XL. And I got an offer back for just under £33,000. So if you want to check the price of a car you're looking at, click on the pop-out banner in the top right-hand corner of the screen or follow the link below the video to use the CarWow configurator. The RAV4 is really nice to drive in town for two reasons. The first is that being hybrid at slower speed, you just coast along silently using the battery power and the electric motor. Now, if you need to and you put your foot down, the petrol engine does kick in to give you a burst of power. And the second reason is that being an SUV, you sit up high to get a good view forward. Also, that raised driving position and long wheel travel means this thing's good over speed humps. Another thing is that this car feels pretty settled over bumpy roads. It's not too bad at all. Now, one of the things with hybrid cars is that when you're braking, the first part of your braking engages the car's inverter, which then charges up the battery and it can make the brake pedal feel a little bit inconsistent. Now let's see how easy it is to park this RAV4. Big, big wing mirrors and these pillars as well. They're quite thin, so they don't create much of a blind spot. Also, the steering's nice and light, so that's good. The reversing camera is helping me out quite a bit. I do wish that the mirror over there would tilt down, but it doesn't, but it's quite easy. The only real issue in terms of visibility is the pillars, they're quite fat. That's it, done. Right, let's get on with the final in-town driving test. Right, and let's see how manoeuvrable this car is. So here's a mini roundabout. It should be fairly easy to get round because this car has quite a tight turning circle for an SUV. It's better than a Volkswagen Tiguan's. It's also better than a Honda CRV's. And yeah, that was an absolute piece 
of cake. On the motorway, the RAV4 is a pretty good long distance car. The seats are nice and comfy and soft, but still supportive. Also, it's reasonably quiet. You do get a bit of tire noise and a little bit of wind whistle from those big door mirrors. It's not quite as quiet as a Citroen C5 Aircross. In fact, you can see my in-depth review of the Citroen C5 Aircross just by clicking up there on the pop out around the top right hand corner of the screen. What does spoil the ambience though is this. I'm gonna accelerate from 50 miles an hour, see how long it gets to 70. Yeah, engine picks up well. We've got a bit of added punch from that electric motor and that's 70. But did you hear that? The drone from the gearbox. What happens is it actually holds the engine's revs at a fixed point where the engine is most efficient, which is good, the bad thing is, is that then it makes the engine just sound like it's going it's like, and it gets on your nerves. Now, the reason they have this kind of gearbox known as a CVT is because it does improve the economy. So let's check out the economy on this car. So that's what I'm averaging. It's all right. Let's see what this Toyota RAV4 is like when you encounter a twisty road. So I'm gonna put it into sports mode, which has added some weight to the steering and it's made the throttle a little bit more responsive. And I've got some red detailing on the speedo sporty not really <laughs> not really at all this car goes around corners well enough it doesn't lean too much in the bends and it grips the road okay the RAV4 is more of a cruiser decent cruiser though Now, if you quite like a family SUV, but really want a diesel, then click up there on the pop-out banner in the top right-hand corner of the screen or follow the link below the video to watch my in-depth review of the Volkswagen Tiguan. But back to the RAV4 now and my verdict. So, should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should shortlist the Toyota RAV4. It's a practical, good to drive, and economical family SUV. Do you agree with my verdict? Let me know in the comments section. Also, please subscribe to this channel for more videos. And if you click on the deals box to the right, you can see how much you can save on a new car at CarWow. Or click on the video windows below to watch another of my videos.